All right, wonderful. Let's make a start. Um, welcome everyone to this Hunter Living Histories Showcase, a hybrid meeting across the physical worlds and the digital. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that we're meeting uh, here at the university on the traditional lands of the Awabakal people in a land called Malamumba. And I'd like to uh, respect and pay homage to their um, elders, both past, present and emerging. And I also want to pay respects to the traditional owners of the lands you're zooming in to us from around um, the region and elsewhere. Um, and also um, acknowledge Indigenous people that are joining us today, either physically or via Zoom. And... Um, and welcome you all here today. Now, um, for those who are physically joining us, just don't forget we've got on the table in front of me in the Special Collections Reading Room is a quarter of our recent acquisitions of coloured engravings and maps that have been purchased. It's about 40 odd that have been acquired by the university and we've got the first um, arrivals. So they're all sitting here dating from 1827, I think. So um, if you get a chance after the meeting concludes at 2.30, um, you're quite welcome to come and have a look. Uh, Anne, do you want to take people through the Zoom etiquette? Hi, yeah, just to remind people to just um, keep yourself on mute, particularly um, when there's the presentations. And if you have a question, you can put your hand up in the reactions little button down the bottom of the Zoom <laughs> screen or put a question in the chat. Uh, we'll probably take questions towards the end after the presentation, let's say, um, the first presentation. Um, and we're recording the, um, the meeting, so that will be up online, but if there's anything in the meeting that anyone's not happy with, um, just, yeah, let me know if you um, want anything sort of edited. Thank you, Anne. Okay, well, it's uh, over to our first guests, um, Yvonne Fletcher and John Gilliam. Now, they had quite a feature article in last Saturday's Herald. Um, and John and Yvonne, you're welcome to speak on any part of this matter involving um, World War I medals. Um, so over to you. Great, thank you. And, and thank you for inviting us along to um, have this uh, uh, presentation with you. Uh, what, what you're going to see is, is sort of 10 years of work that has, has come together. And um, all our work is based in evidence. And um, so this is, this is our findings as such. If anybody would like a copy of our report or the schools program that we're going to talk about today, um, if you'd like to drop me an email at newcastle.edu.au at newcastle.edu.au and um, I'm happy to share it. And, and we really ask people to have a read and scrutinise our work. Um, it's been scrutinised by a lot of people, but <laughs> the more the merrier. And if you see something that um, is not quite au okay, feel free to say something. Uh, I'd just like to just quickly also acknowledge the um, Awabakal people and um, their, their role in our history as a whole. And um, both John and I look forward to some constitutional change as we move forward. I'll hand over to John. John's going to talk about the dark side of our research and then I'll come back and talk about the other side <laughs> of the research. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so the black ops of what we do behind the scenes for the last 10 years. Um, it all started back when uh, we had a desire to do something for the centenary of Anzac. And so Yvonne had already started some research into local soldiers that had fallen. And uh, there, were, we, there were 128 of them from Nelson Bay to Patterson and from Hexham to Karua. And so we started to put together this book called Their Story. And uh, as we were going through that, I came across um, a file that was stamped untraceable. And I looked through this file and this was a, a uh, state boy. So he was an orphan working on a local farm, had no family at all. 
And so the, it, the, I asked around at the we were at a society, we used to sit as one of the old microfiche machines, we used to call it the time machine, because <laughs> we could be winding our way through day after day. And so we're trying to find evidence of, of this person's life, and it was pretty scant. So I was intrigued by what had happened to this man's career and, and his medals and mementos and everything. And so I rang Defence Honours and Awards, who we'll call D, H and A because, you know, we both have ex-military sort of ties and so therefore acronyms come very easily to us. So D, H and A, Defence Honours and Awards. They're the people who deal with the issuing of medals, both historic to families and to current people. So I rang them and I explained this situation and I said, I'd like to know what intraceable means and uh, if you could tell me. Two weeks later, I got a phone call back saying, well, so we don't actually know what untraceable means, uh, but we can confirm that his medals were issued. And I said, all right, who did they issue the medals to and when were they issued? Because there's nobody on here, no receding, there's no, no, uh, no one I could see that they could leave it to. And they said, sir, you must understand that our medal assessors are experts in these things and they know exactly what they're doing. And so, you know, that's been their deliberation. And I went, well, thank you for that. And I hung up and I thought, you know, in the service, we used to call stuff like that bullshit. And I'm thinking, I don't have to smell it to know what I'm, I'm dealing with here. As we proceeded with this, we found four more in the next couple of weeks. So we now had five in a population of about 120 maximum. And that seemed like a significant ratio to me. And so we kept on, we kept on digging. Uh, it was just an interesting thing that flowed from the research. Uh, we've found so much information that we actually created this book called Untraceables, The Mystery of the Forgotten Diggers, because what we started to find was there were several categories of, of people who didn't get their medals for different reasons. Untraceables is obvious, as we've said. Yeah. Uh, pendings were another one where uh, families were in contact with the army, but because of a, a male preference dissension list, and a lot of females here today, you'll understand the argument for this, that for why they would do this. The ascension list was male preference. So it went to father, it went to mother, eldest brother, down the <coughs> line, right? Now imagine if you were the eldest sister, mum had deceased in childbirth, and you'd raise this young fellow, sent him off to war, and he died. And then you write in, you're listed in next of kin and you're listed in the will for this person's estate. The army comes back and says, can you tell us whether there are, whether the father or eldest brother is alive? And I'll say, well, father died some years after mother. My eldest brother's a, a wastrel, an alcoholic. He'll only sell the medals and things. Like they really should come to me. The army would write back and say, what's your eldest brother's address? And so they didn't reply. And so again, pending, this untraceable was the words they used, not ours. Pending was the same. They would write pending on the file, pending the reply. And of course they never got one. So those medals were never issued. Uh, so they were so treasured. We found, um, return people that, you know, uh, suffered all sorts of, of uh, issues when they came back from five years, practically for some five years of fighting, that simply did not want to collect those medals. We call them the disenchanted group. So they, for, and, you know, for whatever reason, they chose not, not to get them. The other group were called forfeits, and they, the forfeits, forfeiting of entitlements was a, a punishment from a court martial. And so the forfeits group, um, Basically, these were kangaroo courts and there was a bit of squaring up done after the end of the war where people were doing minor things like taking some absence without leave to tour England before they went home, this kind of stuff, right? Forfeiting entitlements meant you lost your medals, you lost your deferred pay, which is your own money, a shilling a day taken away. War gratuity was another shilling a day for time in a combat zone. Uh, you lost medical treatment and you lost any right to a pension. So you we were completely divorced from the army. Uh, and again, uh, the army claims there's 3,000 of those, and we've got about 350 names on our list. Uh, the next slot, were, we call them the invisibles. And these were the people who came home so traumatised, they were institutionalised. So they're either physically or mentally really badly <laughs> damaged. And uh, the army's um, policy was that they would not release medals to anyone that was alive. In fact, as long as a soldier was alive, they would not release the medals to any living family member. So you had to wait for the soldier to die. Some of these men had spent their time in institutions for 30 or 40 years 
They outlived their families. There was no family left to leave them to. So that's another category. And the last but not least were the underage. The Army claims there's uh, 691 cases that they know of. We've got 22 <laughs> that we identified. And so um, uh, they was, the reason that they didn't get things was because they'd falsified their enlistment documents. So therefore, can't trust these people. So they get they, the moment they're discovered, and this could be because you've been wounded and a doctor says, you hardly look pubescent, son. Yeah, how old are you? Or a family writes in and says, you know, you've got my son at... Uh, at, at the front, please take him out of the firing line. Happy to keep him in the army till he's 18, but you know, take him away. Well, the moment they're discovered, their pay is severed, everything's cut, and they're sent home. So uh, again, that was the five groups. Now uh, that sounds like uh, you know interesting categories. We have 2,518 names as of today on those lists. It's a significant number that uh, we're, we're being denied. If we just chop the thing. To understand where it all came from, that's what 420,000 files being administered by 400 clerks in 20 different sections of army base records. That's what it looks like. And it's all done manually. What you might find incredible is they could get a letter in and replied back to the person within two days in Australia by so-called snail mail. There's obviously high performance snails back in those days. <laughs> But my point is it's easy to make a difference. Now, when we get on to medals, what you see over here in 1934, this photograph's taken in 1934. See those little trays up there? They're little wooden trays, right? They're full of medals. There were 756,000 medals sent to Australia for, of, of three different types to send it to World War I veterans. So they're all stacked up in there. They are all uh, identified to the person on a little white box with the name, number, rank, et cetera, and a medal number on there. The man on the right, 1995, he's from the Navy. He was a, he, in that day, the, the Army, Navy, Air Force looked after their own. He had Navy medals, and as you can see, he's still got the same little wooden trays, still got the same little white boxes in there, handing them out. He put them into storage just after he left. Keith Freeman put his name in. So what we found here, uh, all World War I medals from World War I to Vietnam, 800,000 were put into storage post 1998. Now that's not us talking. Yvonne talked about the evidence that we have. This that number comes from the Vet Affairs magazine of the, the Department of Veteran Affairs. In 1986, they had 800,000 medals. 10%, 80,000 were World War One medals. But all of those have disappeared. Post 98, contemporary reproductions are used by defence honours and awards. So what they do is they buy medals, blank medals and then engrave them on successful application. So they are obsessed with protecting that stash because they only can buy them once a year. The Royal Mint only will mint them once a year. So they buy a batch. As the batch gets lower, it gets harder for people to actually get their eligibility established. It is you know, sinister stuff. Blood medals. Now, this is an interesting thing because what we found we were alerted to this from, from a, uh, one of our followers on our Facebook page. We called it blood medals because, pull this one here, it's been coined to describe a medal that has been pilfered from a medal archive. Like blood diamonds, there's an immoral and most often illegal lucrative trade flour flourishing in attractive items that have been earned by the sacrifice of others. So that... Uh, uh, cache of medals that's been put away is absolutely denied by DHNA. They deny its existence. However, uh, the Australian Service Medal 1935 was issued in 1949. It's the last medal issued. So you'll see soldiers with a rack of medals on them, right? Old soldiers. They'll have uh, Pacific Stars, North Africa Stars. They've got Defence Medals. They've got the War Medal, 3945. They're all Imperial Medals. They're English. The one you, that says you're Australian is this medal called the Australian Service Medal, 1939 It is highly sought after on international markets because it now makes, uh, for a collector, it gives me this Australian connection. And now I can buy other medals and put with it sort of thing. Now, the thing is that in Australia, they always come as a set because it's the last one. So all the other medals would have been established for you plus this, plus this medal at the end. So how is it then that individual medals turn up on international markets? 
And they aren't just any old peoples. They are, for those of you that may know, they're Z-Force commandos. So these are the people who attack Singapore Harbour in the middle of the war. They are prisoners of war from the Thai Burma Railway who died building that railway. Uh, Torpedo on the Monte Vadeo Maru by the Americans as they were being transported to Japan. So these are the only female anti-aircraft gunner in the Australian Army who happened to be based in Darwin. So they are pretty unique people, and yet they turn up like magic on international auction sites. How could that be, do you think? And so <clears throat> a long time ago, a wise man once told me that I, if I was ever to start a gunfight, I was to make sure I had more ammunition than the, than the other guy did before I started. But let me tell you, the other guy's got a very blunt butter knife. And right here is the ammunition that we need that's going to sink them and basically force them into action. Uh, oh, the error rate down the bottom there, we haven't touched on that. Those untraceables, as we said, it took us, how long, like five years or more, before they agreed that an untraceable was untraceable and the medals had not been issued. And Yvonne will talk more about the significance of that. Up until that point, uh, we, had to, we did about 10 in a row. Six of them were rejected. So when the rejections come through, we get on to the local member and we say, can you write to the minister and ask for the evidence because they can confirm, is their word, we confirm these medals have been issued. And we say, based on what evidence do you have? Whereas Yvonne says, how do you know that to be true? He teaches children that. How do you know that to be true? Within 24 hours, those decisions are overturned and the medals are issued. So, you know, there is something not right in that department, in the way, in the culture of that department. So, let me read to you from the minister's words himself. Okay, this is the current one. We wrote the previous one got a nonsense reply, we wrote to the current one and we got almost a word for word response back. But I'll, I'll pick two lines out of this to show you what we are dealing with here. While likely, while likely destroyed through normal administrative processes with the passage of time, we may never know with certainty what became of the original medals. Really? So if they've been destroyed, most likely, the next line down says, Regarding your claims of alleged theft of World War II medals, I am advised that a review of departmental records found no information or evidence of theft. Now, I can pardon the ignorance of people that, you know, work in an area where 30 years ago, a decision was made to put things away for whatever reason, we suspect it was a simple budget cut, but to put them away and hide them away, basically. 30 years later, how could they possibly know? They could possibly know when we sat down and we went through this information with them and they are still in denial. So it says their lack of evidentiary documentation in their statements because they confirm everything without anything. And so just to show the gap in the documentation, uh, Yvonne did this study, the study. Yep. I'd like to read that out. So we wanted to show that there was a, a gap in the National Archives. So currently Defence Honours and Awards use the personal uh, dossier, the personal file of the soldier to make a determination of whether those medals have been assessed. Mm -hmm. Queensland and New South Wales are notorious for not putting receipts on file. So those receipts are somewhere else. Uh, Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia all put receipts on file. So when we surveyed 100 soldiers from, returned soldiers from both uh, New South Wales and Victoria, we found that 94 of those 100 in New South Wales had no evidence of their medals being issued on file. And only six had receipts for the issuing of their file. But when we looked at Victoria, only 21 had no evidence of their medals being issued on file and 79 had receipts showing that those medals had been issued. So they're basing their, their um, assessment of people's families' medals on a flawed piece of evidence. They haven't got the full picture. And they're very, very reluctant to get to release a returned soldier's medals. We've tried. And with one soldier, we've tried five times so far. And we actually went and found a distant relative and said, okay, you try. 
and it's still bouncing back, it's about to come back. Given that he was dead at the time, it would be unlikely that he could apply for his medals, you would think. But somehow they were they can confirm that. With no evidence. With no evidence. Okay. Uh, we also believe that um, from the anecdotal evidence we've got from past medal assessors and other people who've worked in the field, that the documentation is with the medal somewhere. And we don't believe they've been destroyed because they cannot produce a destruction order. Now, remember, these went into, they only went into storage in 98 at the very earliest. And we have evidence from the paper saying they've gone into storage. So we know they went into, into places. There's nothing of them coming out or having been destroyed. So, so then we looked at what, what is actually in the National Archives. And so we surveyed this SERI MT138-2 from the National Archives, which is all the records held from Army Base Records from World War I. They have gazillions of copies of registers of badges, you know, mother's badges, return from active service badges, um, a whole lot of badges, but not one medal roll. When we looked further afield, we did find a couple of medal rolls that had come from the military districts, such as Queensland, which is first military district. Uh, but they were those medal rolls that went over to England to have the medals minted and engraved. There's no register back. And we know those medals moved around the country. They moved into military districts, out of military districts. Some went overseas to England to be issued and we've got evidence on files of some of them coming back. There should be registers tracking that movement. And we believe that they're with that um, stash there. Yes. There is also no evidence for World War II, Korea, <laughs> Vietnam, and all stops in between. So Our belief is based on the fact that if this was, if all these medals were, were one day told that we're going to shut down issuing these medals, so you guys that work in the warehouse where they're stored, pack them all up, send them away, uh, the belief you'd have to think is somebody's going to want these one day, so we'll pull all the paperwork with them and send them away. So that whoever uncovers this again will be able to just start where we left off. I mean, I think that's a, a fair assumption to make. Uh, and so that's what we believe. Find one, you'll find the other. Okay. So we're, we're not continually bagging DHA. Oh, this is the good side. This, of is, house, the good side. this is the good side. This is, we've yeah, heard right. the bad side. This is a good side. What you see there is the return of a set of medals that were marked untraceable. So we worked with Defence Honours and Awards and had 16 sets nationally pre established for eligibility. So they established that, yes, they hadn't, they were untraceable, and these form part of a school project. So these were a set of medals that belonged to William King, who was born in Maitland. He's an Aboriginal soldier. And these, these are our Aboriginal students marching him <laughs> into the hall where they were handed to a, a Wanarua elder who brought his spirit home, who allowed him to come home back onto Wanarua land. And um, they're in the custody of the school. And I must say, they are in the custody only. We could not find his family. So the school is holding them and they will continue to research to find his family. Better historians than me have, have failed in this effort and they, the consensus is he's had, the family is gone. But I have a feeling maybe his family doesn't know him yet. And as more people identify and trace their family history, Hopefully one day we'll get them. And then it's a citizenship for the school to hand those medals back to the family. Now, what school is that? Thornton Public School. Thornton. So we created the Find the Remember Them Creating Citizen Historians. I have to acknowledge Heather over here because Heather was um, reviewed some of this work before it went out um, and has been a great support of all our programs. So. From the curriculum, both New South Wales and the National Curriculum for HASS, History and Social Science, and History for High School, it requires teachers to use the process of historical inquiry to have students work as an historian would, the same way all of you work. Mm. New South Wales K-6 HISI syllabus, which is history geography essentially, has gone one step further, and I love this because I, I use this with 
um, politicians all the time because they require students to answer the question, how do you know? And that equals evidence. So if you ask the students at Thornton about William King, he'll tell you, and if you say, how do you know? They'll say, well, we got that out of the paper or we got that from talking to uh, probably Mrs Fletcher or they got it from the actual records or we got it from the War Memorial. The FTRT allows students to work within the confines of the community of the practice of the historian. So we want them working within that larger community and this is where all of you come into, into play as well. So it's an authentic learning process project, real research for real purpose. We're not doing this just to publish something to stick on the wall. We're doing this to um, inform the community and to form the greater Australia as well. So this is what it looks like. We took Lau's framework, which actually she developed it for um, geography and science over in Canada, but it fits for us. Uh, so it has four um, sort of cycles within it. So the first one is a launch of the development of this overarching project questions and the planning of it. So it's a, it's a launch, it's a big day. We might have something stimulus, we might have a historian come in and talk about it. We might go for and have a look at the World War I virtual tour of the War Memorial. And then we start talking about, and the children start talking about what their big question is they want answered. So for William King, it was who was William King and where is his family? Now, we couldn't answer all of that. I just interrupt. I mean, one of the, the beginnings of this is to take a name, hopefully, off a local memorial or from a, a family so that it's a, a local soldier that kicks this off and then they start this, what do I want to know about him? That's right. We then move into the research, which is historical inquiry, and some questions are generated as needed to answer that major project question. And skills are developed as they're needed. So whatever those skills may be. And knowledge, because for William King, we had to, we had to do a big deep into stolen generation to find out why we couldn't find his family and why he didn't have a birth certificate was a great revelation to a lot of people. At that point, if they, are, if they find a set of medals or if they're part of the trial, they apply for that a medal and they provide justification for it. So William King was born in Maitland. Um, you know, uh, they may have that um, the soldier was living in the same area that they were, that the school is. They then, as part of that um, historical inquiry, they need to engage with experts in the field. So the teacher is seen as a guide only, especially in primary schools. The teacher is often the font of all knowledge. But what we advocate is that the teacher models that I don't know that question, where I don't know the answer to that, where could we find it? Who do we need to talk to? So we may need to go to the archives. We may need to go back to national archives. We may need to come somewhere like an archive like this and look for local history and local events. We may need to go to Trove and things like that. So they're actually um, engaging with the community. And with Zoom at the moment, we can Zoom with all sorts of experts right across the world and go and visit areas as well. The last part is our outside audience. Remember, this is a real project. So communicating their research and the production of a historical product. It's just not doing the research up. That's it. We've done. We've ticked the box. Let's move on. We need an historical product. And that could be a little movie, a documentary, PowerPoint presentation, a book whatever. And then they're required to leave that pro that information somewhere public. So we advocate either the ANZAC portal, so where they can add that information that they've looked for it, so there's a footprint for future people, or the virtual war memorial in South Australia. These are the medals so far that have come home. William Kelly came home very early in, 19, in 2018. Keith Griffin, he came home to Hinton Public School. We actually found the family. Keith was one of our original five and uh, the gentleman who we contacted, who was related to him, his great nephew, he said, look, nobody in the family is really interested. I want them to go to the school. So they went back to Hinton School. Theodore Chambers came back to Fern Bay. He was a state school boy who lived in Fern Bay with the Smith family. Uh, William King, we've spoken about. Henry Crowley, 
is in coming home on Friday to Lochinvar and the children there did the thing that the army couldn't do 100 years ago, they found his family. Through good quality research, they were able to locate him. They have the medals. They will hand the medals to the Crowley family and the Crowley family in return is handing a replica set to the school. Uh, that's the ultimate in it, to find that family and to, to have that citizenship to hand it over. Uh, Seymour Lynn is um, Portside Christian College in South Australia. He's coming home on Friday as well. And Ernest Otis, who we've been trying to get home since 2019, is finally coming home to Auburn Public School. He died on the landing. He's buried at the Armistice. Auburn Public School has a large Turkish population and it's a reconciliation between the two countries. So the, the Turkish children have ownership in this because it's the Turks that look after Otis's uh, remains now. John, finish it off. Oh, well, there you go. Well, I mentioned the numbers there before. So there you go, two and a half thousand that we have. So we, it's a considerable body of evidence that says there's an awful lot of people that didn't collect the medals. Our, our personal belief is there's tens of thousands of them. That's where you know 80,000 medals come from. And we've been very conservative, just cutting it in half and half again kind of thing. So uh, there's an awful lot of them out there that, mm -hmm. uh, that are unaccounted for. Uh, uh, you know, make no mistake, our resolve is to have this sorted out with defence honours and rewards and to get to get some action taken. Before we die. Before we die. And we, the, the pivotal thing, why, it is, why the, uh, as I always say, it was an interest that became a passion and now it's an obsession because these people have pushed us back and back and back and now it's time to, to push right back, yeah? And we're painting them into a corner at the moment where they've got no wriggle room. And so, um, so we'll, sort, uh, we'll get that sorted, we think. And now with the support of the media, uh, this will never pass a pub test anywhere in this country. People are naturally outraged by them. So we'll see them there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, John and Yvonne. And now who's got their... Um... We seem to have a bit of feedback. Okay. <laughs> Is that you, Doug? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, John and Yvonne. If we've got some time at the um, close of the meeting, unless, Ron, you've got a, a burning question? Uh, not a question, but a positive thing. Yeah. Uh, which uh, Yvonne and uh, someone have been involved with is we had a medal handed in at the fort, which was uh, belonged to a Thomas Jasper. Yeah. Our uh, people cleaned it up and uh, we went to the Maitland Historical Society. Uh, Sorry, Ron. Doug, I think you've got your... Um... Hello? There you go. Okay. Sorry. You are right? Yep. I think we had a bit of noise coming through on one of the channels. All right. We, uh, so we went to the Maitland Family History and eventually I got a couple of emails, one from Lynette Martin who was able to show that uh, her, her family uh, dated back to Thomas Jasper. And then one of the things I was dreading, I got a second email that said, Thomas Jasper's my family. And uh, I thought, oh, what do we do here? So I emailed back to the person and said, look, surprising, you're the second person that's contacted us, but you've both got the same uh, surname Martin and anyway the message came back I, I said you know do you know Lynette Martin and anyway the message came back from Jack and said yes she's my uh, father's brother's daughter or something like that so they their family they're they're sorting it out it was we were told it was found uh, initially in the pool but what happened was Darakon lifted all the pool of the, where they're doing the Newcastle bars. All the sand was put on the other, the Newcastle beach side of uh, the canoe pool. And a bloke by the name of Trenton Knight 
who was on a building society, a building site nearby, was too windy to be up where he had to be working. So he was having a bit of a walk around. Most of the sand had disappeared. And he noticed this sticking out of the ground, picked it up. And it was the metal that was at where the sand had been dropped, it had been wedged in and so on. So I'd had contact with the Daracon people trying to find if they knew who it was. And eventually we, uh, we, we've tracked it all down. So what we're trying to do now is to get them all together and uh, get a story for the Herald or the uh, tele TV and so on for it to, to get the medal back to the, uh, to the family. So it's a positive one in relation to what we've just heard, which we're, we've had that discussion at the Ford as well. Yes, that's been Thanks, one of the big arguments with us that um, you'll never find the relatives of any of these people anyway. And they also say that those medals would have been rusted away. If we put them in storage, they're rusted away. They're all gone. Um, <laughs> there you are, one sitting in salt water for years. Um, and there's relatives. So um, if you think about it, 100 years generationally isn't a big big time. I mean, I'm a, I'm a granddaughter of a Gallipoli veteran. Uh, so there's plenty of family still around that probably hasn't. And as we say, it's the story of why they didn't collect those medals that's important because there's obviously some reason why. As I was saying the other day to you, or I sent you an email, they take a long time. It took me from 2016 to the 19th of August, this just got mm. to get someone put on the honour roll who, yeah. you know, was killed yeah. in Korea, and mm. it took that long for them to actually put it up. They have, they've got them on the honour roll, but they haven't got the um, a metal thing, you know, out yeah. the front. They have to wait mm. until they do, do a new casting. But that involved setting up committees and all sorts, and that's all the evidence that he was killed. Mm. But it still took that long, oh, so yeah. keep mm. plodding along. Well, one of the, they said, uh, part of this reply in here says that they did this extensive search of their documents. And uh, that was that was the search took from when we, we timed it from when we wrote the letter, well, sorry, when we sent the letter to when they sent the reply, it was five weeks. And what we say is if they wouldn't have made their coffee in that time. So this meeting, this extensive research took part around the coffee machine, we think, you know. As I said, this is 10 years worth and they can do it in five weeks and then find nothing. Yeah. It's, it's got a way to run yet. We, we think another year or so yet, but, but we'll get there in the end. Oh, well, um, keep up the good work. And um, I know it can get controversial at times, but I mean, that's, uh, that's all part of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the journey, I guess. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to our next topic now, which is the Hunter Valley Museum of Rural Life, which also got quite a spread in the media recently. Um, it was a project that we had been involved with back in 2010. And... Um, but the local community out there at Aberdeen is very interested in revi reviving it. So this was a museum that had been established in the mid sixties um, out at Glenbourne Dam. So I'm going to hand over to uh, firstly, Dr. Amir Mogadam, who's our conservator here that was working with the Aberdeen community at the time. And also Mrs. Leslie Gent, who's in the room. Um, okay. Now on the Hunter Living History site, we've compiled all the original reports, um, MBN footage about the opening, um, everything we've been able to find in uh, with the idea that if um, maybe we have academics or students interested in doing a project involving this museum, then we've got as much of the source material sitting there now, um, including an entire inventory that Leslie put together. Um, and also all the work that has been um, done since. Okay, so over to you, Amir. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I just would give a little bit of explanation about what we have done in that about that project, and then surely we need to hear from Leslie as well, who I think is a pioneer in this, in the, uh, or like early person, earliest person thinking of this collection. Uh, there is a post, as John said, in the Hunter Living Histories. Would you like me to share a photo from the post or everyone have seen 
I might, I might just put the post up while you're talking. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I'll like, do that. I mean, I'll do that. With yeah, yeah, with an image of yeah, uh, sure. with an image of the museum. Well, um, yeah, in in ta in 2010, we got an inquiry from uh, land and property management, uh, which was a which was an office or like governmental. Uh, um, office in the time it doesn't exist anymore uh, in conjunction with TAFE and uh, Upper Hunter uh, TAFE and Upper Hunter community uh, to deliver uh, to, to visit the site and also deliver a few sessions about how to preserve uh, the museum content and the museum itself. Um, the, the building is located in very strange place. Uh, clearly, um, uh, uh, it has been very popular uh, place during 1960s and 1980s probably, um, but uh, given the distance that it has from any, um, any major town or city and its close proximity to the dam itself, it created lots of problems. Um, in, the, in the time, the Upper Hunter community was looking for any suggestion or any, any uh, like strategy to, to uh, do something about the museum that have been closed for many, many years. Um, so the situation of the museum is not, was not good. And I think that nothing has happened since then. So I can tell it is not good even now. Um, the building has lots of issues. The items have been left to, uh, left to just deteriorate. Um, rodents and uh, mold and dust and everything that you can imagine uh, you can uh, you can uh, like see over there um, but the major problem that we that we um, identify was lack of um, lack of decision making and uh, like, in, in fact, nobody wanted to take responsibility for the place. And there have been some conflict between the local people and the land and property management office, which me and Johnny, in fact, functioned as peace negotiators. You remember, John? <laughs> we went there in the middle of uh, like a fierce fight just to calm down people and just put them together. Everything was going fine, but suddenly that department dissolved. And after the, 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 the one of the community leaders who was chasing this passed away, unfortunately. Um, so we had uh, an interesting inquiry a few weeks ago that uh, uh, a newspaper, um, the Herald newspaper wanted to have a story on it. Um, and yeah, we, we, we shared uh, our ideas. I think that it is very important collection to be saved somehow. Um, it narrates the story of people of the region for a time that um, the place was uh, very active and um, like, I mean, in the in the films that Johnny and Anne have discovered from our collections, you could see that people traveled there by planes, dressed up, and like it was a serious deal to to visit the place. Uh, but as you can see, the photo uh, that John is now showing, it is in 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 horrible situation. Um, well, I think to like we have developed uh, some preservation plans, 
We also did assess the need for it. I think Leslie could also talk about the, the things that she did before us, um, but it didn't go like to like it didn't uh, end up to any any useful and any beneficial outcome for the museum and for the local people so i think it would be good if there is any like discussion any like brainstorming any advocacy just to rescue the collection from its current situation we can talk about different strategies but it would be lengthy I don't think that it is the time for it, um, but yeah, like um, it's a valuable collection that is just deteriorating and being vandalized. And on that note, I pass it to Leslie uh, for her further and deeper um, comments on that. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Olivia. Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I started cataloguing the Glenbourne collection uh, 2005. I lived and breathed it for 12 months and most of the time I smelled of rats and, because it was just been empty for so long and disgusting. Um, the catalogue consisted actually of over 2,500, um, that's it zipping up there now, um, 2,500 individual items. Uh, of that, I did two catalogues, a location catalogue and a numerical one. The location catalogue, which took a lot of work, was to help me uh, because there wasn't any security and I could come back the next week and find if something was missing because I had a location catalogue, which sort of gets off that. that that's my rough way of doing it. Um, uh, of the 2,500 pieces, individual pieces, there were, I was talking to Mia, 30% of them were, have been neglected through vermin attack and 10% of them we think were not be able to be retrieved at all, which is a shame. Now the collection itself is the history of the Hunter Valley. The donors were primarily families from the Hunter, so it's their history. And the first report I found of the collection was in 1964 when the Lake Glenmore National Park Trust, as it was called then, uh, set aside an area of land near the Oak Kiosk for the establishment of the Royal uh, Rural Museum. And they'd already collected hundreds of pieces before they even designed the museum. Um, and one of the things they were going to do was bring down the um, cottage belonging to the Hall family from Sater, if you're familiar with that area, and bring it down and put it down and uh, recreate a cottage, same, similar thing as what Sketchley Cottage is um, there, but that never eventuated, um, which unfortunately, but someone did make a model of it and it's in, in the museum, little slab hut there. Um, the architect's um, drawings were done on the 18th of May, 1964. So that was a long time ago. Now, Jack Scar, he was the uh, chairman, president or whatever of the dairy company. He was the innovator. He wanted it done because he'd seen them overseas. And um, it was opened in 1966, as Amir said, mm -hmm. but it was never, ever going to succeed. You can see that now. Um, in 1978, Jack Scar went back and did a report on it. And that's only 12 years after it was open and it was scathing report. And he was so bitterly disappointed. He died two years later without having seen anything being done to improve it. But he, a list of things that he did, I've got a copy of his report there, uh, that he mentioned that just been neglected and of course the families what he'd done he would have gone around speaking to families who had donated items and the descendants were in 1978 complaining bitterly that their items are deteriorating rapidly that's only 12 years after it was established so it was never ever going to succeed at, in the format that they had um, Oh, yes, and the, the families were saying things like they'd have never made them available had they known that their precious items weren't going to be 
looked after. And he said urgent need to care for the outside exhibit. See, there's um, all sorts of things outside. While I was doing that, I organised an open day with the park, whatever it was called then. I think it was still the state control, if I remember rightly. And we got in touch with as many donors or their families as possible who came to have a look. Uh, to say it was, it was disappointing for them on the whole, um, We've got to, I've mentioned this before, there was a Windy Bible there and someone had, which had in the front pages all the names, you know how they used to write the births and deaths and that in the front of the Bible. Someone had come and torn out the front pages of the Bible. So all that information was gone. It would have been far better had they stolen the whole Bible, at least it would have been intact. The um, grand piano that is up there belongs to Windy, it came from Tom ago house uh, should have been back anyway the cards the only saving how i ended up getting uh all the information was that they had cards mr scar organized these cards uh if you remember me the little cards that were there and he got that in 1978 and he had them printed in melbourne and, they, and bought up and the, i could take the things that are missing because the cards are there and the items not. Uh, people are foolish when they steal and they don't take the evidence away as well. Um, the missing items, um, which are huge missing items, I've got all these pages of missing items. Uh, it's going on and on and on. So there's just hundreds and hundreds of things being stolen. One of the things that is very, very disappointing, we have the gold um, a scabbard for Bedwell's um, dagger. The dagger's gone and the scabbard's still there. Um, you just can't imagine the things that are missing. But the damage is the, is the problem and I don't see what they can do about it. Or most of the round um, uh, records, you know, the cylinders, because damp and mould affects them so much, they're all, nearly all of those are no good, no good. Um, and I don't know, I've put in recommendations to the state park that could maybe help. Mr. Cut Scar was going on about the um, tinting on the windows and all that sort of thing to help preserve it hadn't been done. And, so when anyone can come up with a brilliant idea of what we can do with all those products, there was uh, one suggestion that the family's almost just gone now. Um, let's if, contact the families and see how many of them wanted their goods back uh, or to donate them to some other museum. It is too big a collection for um, Scone Historical Society or any of those. It, it is just too big for them. Uh, well, most people wouldn't be able to handle it anyway. Uh, so I don't know, and it's too far out of town and it's away, but as I said, it was never going to succeed. It was 12 years after. It was in a shopping, right? and now so we're talking. So supposed to have run it? The well, they, there was a state parks, you know, state parks, and then it became the Crown Lands, I think, was the next episode. Now, I think it might, is it me? Has it gone back to the state, do you know? Uh, uh, no, like the, as I said, the ownership of it is in the state of the limbo. Like nobody knows, like who this belongs to now. Yeah. And it was at the time that we we have been discussing. Yeah. I think it was about going to like like the land and property management wanted to make it make a decision one, one way or another, whether it is going to the community or it is going to land and property. But because the department was dissolved, then like not, nothing happened on that matter. And you're right, like the, the location of the museum is just, uh, I mean, it, it puts itself uh, to like, for to be not successful, put it that way. Um, it is far from anything and uh, hardly can get people now traveling there to just visit the museum. 
anyway, anyone has any bright ideas, <laughs> or would we welcome? Um, I, there are some pieces that really, as Amir will know, have really had to be preserved or removed uh, mm -hmm. and put somewhere safe. It's just uh, more and more people. There was no security system there when I went. It had been nothing. And they put in a security system which wasn't really super, it was more to keep vandals away. Someone tried to get in without a key, the alarm would ring and you could probably hear it in scone. But <laughs> it didn't do any good because by the time they got from the office <laughs> to the museum, someone could have picked, you know, the, the good stuff out. And yeah. uh, so it, um, I would like to see the items that are really, really precious and irreplaceable or irreplaceable. They've only sort of one of them or something. Things like they've never maintained the leather. And if you know, if you don't oil the leather and keep it up, it just cracks and crumbles. Mm -hmm. And sulfur bellows there, they've just disintegrated because the leather has never been looked after. Saddles and child saddles and things like that. So. Uh, if and we the ever Stone find museum out, isn't interested in any of them. No, no so. one really. And the Aberdeen people tried to do it, but it was, I think it would be too big a job for them, actually, it wasn't it? I mean, it really was too, was far too big a job. Uh, yeah. I, I, think, yeah. I, I think realistically, in the context of this museum, so we are only are talking about this, um, like one way to resolve the problem is just returning the material to to the owner or to the descendants of the owners mm -hmm. and then just if and, and repatriate some of the aboriginal material and then like whatever remains then having it in the smaller place maybe in in the town of like scone or in place like that but um I think it, it needs a brave decision making and someone because it, it costs a lot. The, 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 the thing is that it would be a costly and like time consuming project. Well, we have anyway, a donors list as well. So yeah. a lot of the My, people, families are still in the area. Yeah. Uh, one chap wrote and said, oh, he just couldn't find any. If he went to Scone Historical Society, everyone in a small town knows everyone and they know where the grandchildren are and all that. It'd be quite easy to find a lot of the donors, I think. Well, Don, yeah, um, it would be uh, love the things from uh, Winnie, Winnie is, I'm sure. Anyway. I know, I know that some of the material has gone to the Powerhouse Museum for care. So um, there might be, there might, I mean, look, it depends on community interests anyway we've, we've done our bit at, at putting all the documentation out there so if a, a consortium of different people government uh, educational um, and local um, want to do something then we're we're we're, we're prepared but it's okay if, if the um, parks department or whoever owns it now the people who bought the caravan park that i'm sure they don't own that collection i've no. had correspondence from people, emails from people in Scone, and they're saying they are, the people who bought the caravan park own the collection. The collection doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the people of the hunter. It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. not just that, so that. What about the um, planned uh, museum for the post office, you know, in the basement? Maybe some of the Aboriginal mm -hmm. artifacts could go there. Yeah, but from a look of the listing there, they came from all over the place, not just the region. Some look like they've come from Central Australia. So this yeah, it might yeah. be a might be an interesting um project just there. Um, so, sorry, just uh, by the post office, you mean the 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 Newcastle old post yeah. office? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, see, again, like this was proposed in the same year, and as you can see. People are making decision about that for now, like mm. ten years or more. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, look. Thank you, um, Amir no and Leslie. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's on the record now. So, if anyone has has an interest, I'm sure that there might be some moves afoot. I know that there's interest in the Aberdeen community. Whether that is sustained, we'll see. And um, if they need the help, well, there might be academics and students interested. Um, in organising, even in architecture, 
um, to have a look at this issue. Anyway, we'll just leave it there and um, see what happens in the future. So thank you very much. Um, all right, now we've got some uh, updates from the Hunter Regional Groups. And first cap off the rank is the Hunter Rainbow Histories Group Inaugural History Walk with John Whitty. John. Okay. Right. Um, just a minute. Um, okay, good. <laughs> Share screen. And... Um, Um, am I sharing a screen with people or? No, not yet, John. We can see you. We can see you now. Not now? Okay. I'll try again. Um, desktop? No. And here we go. Yes. I'll and, and share. Off we go. That's it? Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> Good. And we start at the end. So um, so this talk was, um, it was to be a part of the Pride Festival, which was um, for a month, uh, October, November. The, um, but um, we couldn't organise ourselves in public insurance, public liability insurance for the walk. So um, it was too late. So we just... Um, did it off the off um, our own bat. Um, now the book. How do we, we do this now? View um, escape. Uh, um, so we, pu we published a, or made a little book for the people to come along. We, we advertised the walk in um, the Sydney um, gay websites, gay, gay history websites and Newcastle gay, um, gay history work, uh, work site, uh, websites. Um, and, and the tickets were sold on Everbright and apparently we, more people from Sydney came up for the exhibition than locals attended. Um, which is interesting. Um, now, what we did, what we were trying to do is just um, cover briefly um, LGBT, or well, we could say same-sex attracted uh, crimes in the um, in Newcastle um, from oh, the colonial times, and we went up to 1952, um, and we talked about. Um, We've talked about the laws themselves and explained to people what were the anti-homosexual laws and how the how the vagrancy laws were used against women. And we also um, explained the courts, where the courts were, when they were built, um, the where the Newcastle jail was, and um, and um, the lockup. What what where, what was in the lockup before? What was what was there now? Um, how it was constructed. So we, we went into the lockup and had a look around. Um, uh, we began looking um, at the cells where men and women were locked up, and I gave an overview of both of the places of justice and detention in the 19th century and the laws. I just said that. We inspected the tiny cell where in 1878 two sailors were caught by Water Police Constable Mundy in the act of in the act in a tiny cell. Um, afterwards, I found not guilty. And the women's cells where the female larrikins of the Sand Hills um, were held um, uh, in 1887 prior to their appearance before the magistrate. Then to Watt Street, we walked then to Watt Street, and there's me, and we're look, and we're um, I'm explaining there um, what Watt Street was, where the, the sailors' boarding houses were located, and um the uh, where the where the jail where the jail was and the women's uh, factory was and also um also where the girls industrial school was in the old in the old barracks um then we 
I dug up a, a press report from the time, from 1871, I think from Melbourne, describing um, what happened at the, the right at the Girls' Industrial School and drawing a link between um, the contemporary um, female larrikins in Melbourne um, and, and the opinion of the uh, journalists of the women of Newcastle. And it, it was a pretty damning description of the women of Newcastle, generalisation about what sort of women they were and expect this sort of thing from women of, 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 their, of their background. Um, but it was sort of indi indicative of working class women and women who just um, um, stood up against what was a, a pretty um, uh, broken system at the girls' industrial school. Um, I've tried to emphasise both male and female, and it was hard because, we, as you know, when the lesbian sex was never uh, illegal, so we had to look at um, the use of the Vagrancy Act um, uh, of locking up women who had no um, lawful um, uh, lawful occupation, um, and then we that's how they dealt with the female arrogans. They rounded them up um, and. Um, they got six months in jail and one was sent back to her father. Um, <clears throat> there was also a, a, a tricky point where um, in 1840 in the UK, they were, they were making a decision about whether convict transportation should continue. And the inquiry, the Molesworth inquiry, took submissions from um, the High Park barracks, um, the Blue Mountains um, uh, road construction teams uh, and the female factories around the country, in particular the Ross factory in Tasmania. But in Newcastle, where we have both the, a barracks, work gangs and a female factory, there is no nothing on the public record about uh, same-sex activity. And same-sex activity in these places of work was a major problem elsewhere. Um, and they, the superintendents took a lot of, uh, made, uh, made it their business to make sure um, the, the men and the women were, um, were separated and were punished for any same-sex activity. At next stop was 138 um, Hunter Street. Um, now this was uh, built over in about 1967 with a bank in, in that bank and, and now it's the discount chemist. But 138 was sort of in the middle there, and that was the shop that, that Keith Robinson um, hired for these menswear story in 1952. Um, uh, from there, I covered the police blitz of 1952, also known as the Yellow Sox Affair, and then noted the uh, occupations of the men's men arrested. And all of our Keith were labourers, shop assistants and, and soldiers. And mention has been made of higher ups who, who were in that same circle, but were never, never touched by the police raids. Um, down to Market Street and, and we looked across to the harbour and sort of imagined what the shoreline would have been in 1876 and the boat harbour where the sailors would come ashore or would row ashore from their boats, then go to the hotels in the area. Um, the case of, um, it's the case of, uh, sorry, which was, uh, well, oh, here we go. Uh, Frank Redman, um, a sailor who was uh, lodging in, in Watt Street, um, chats up John Taylor in the boat harbour. And what unfolded there was basically um, a, a chat up between the two men and um, them going back to um, Frank Redman's um, digs in Watt Street. And I, I'm suggesting this was perhaps one of the first um, uh, cases where the, the, a, um, a beat, uh, a place where um, homosexual men met um, has been documented. It's about six years earlier than what um, Gary Wotherspoon has found in Sydney. It's just a matter of, I guess, of finding more in the, in the public record going back. But it's interesting that as far back as 1876, uh, men were going to boat, the boat harbour uh, and chatting up sailors as they came ashore. 
and we looked across the current shoreline and imagined what it was in 1923 when two labourers were arrested for indecent assault in the toilets uh, of the uh, of the market wharf. Um, now, what I thought that I'd end the talk, the talk on, uh, on a good and a high note. Um, their appeal for their three-year sentence for indecent assault um, was um, was one of the very very few cases of men standing up and fighting the homophobia of the police and the courts. The appeal judge. They won the appeal, and the appeal judge lists serious errors committed by the, the preeminent judge, Judge Hamilton, in how he ran the case and directed the jury on the character, on the character of the defendants. And uh, it, it wasn't the homosexuality; it was the character. But I think there's uh, reason to believe that's what he was suggesting. I argued that the landmark Douglas and Ann case in 1952. Douglas and Ann was Australia's preeminent. Uh, graphic designer, designing um, Australian coins and um, pavilions at international fairs. Um, he was uh, arrested in the toilets in Chatswood. And when he was beaten and arrested, um, it was a huge outcry. And if you read the papers of that period, it, 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 it was headlines right around Australia and everyone from the, uh, the uh, Liberals to the Communist Party were up in arms. He won his case, but if we go back to 1923, the case of these two gentlemen um, was uh, uh, James Screen and Daniel McCarthy have been forgotten. And it, it's, uh, I thought that it's, we should recognise that in Newcastle, um, we had two men who fought the system and they won. So that was it. And, and thanks very much. <laughs> well, thanks very much, John. That's fantastic. This is actually a walk now. So um, that's great. So, all right, look, we better get a toddle on. Um, Dr. Ian Eckford with the Family History Society, Newcastle Family History Society. And I'm representing the um, Family History Society. So today, and um, what we'd like to mention is that the female convicts, I don't know whether you all know, but, you know, the Family History Society, Newcastle and Maitland have put together a great um, book on co female convicts that were sent to this area, you know, back in the colonial days. And now what they're continuing on, they're going to making a it's sort of like a doco drama. It's going to have some reenactments imagine reenactments of the female convicts talking with each other and um, you know about the female convicts and there's going to be a seminar on the 5th of March um, in the Maitland round near the Maitland jail or in the Maitland jail I think um, on female convicts in the north so you'll get an invite closer to that date um, I may be giving a talk on that day, I think, uh, about Molly Morgan, you know, the notorious Molly Morgan, our beloved Molly Morgan. Mm. And um, just while I've got the floor, I'd just like to mention that the, um, the Nobby's Lighthouse installation, they hold exhibits up there now. The Hunter Writers Centre is in charge of those exhibits. And there's going to be one plan for July next year is notable women in the history of Newcastle and Hunter Valley. So I'm on a team with Christine Bramble and Barbara Heaton and where um, there's going to be 17 women. So we're prepared a, a big database for Karen Crofts, the head of the Hunter Writers Centre to choose. So it's going to be diverse over time and um, and type of person. Um, so that's something to look forward to next year as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Look, um, thank you very much, Jude. And please pass on our best to Ian. I had no idea. So I wish I you the best. You. Okay. Uh, National Cr Trust, Hunter National Trust update. Um, Ross. Um, look, I thought um, Amanda or Mark was going to give a report. Look, I just mentioned an ongoing issue in Newcastle is what can be referred to as facadism. That is a, a building um, has been um, notified. I mean, it's been registered, but all they do is keep the facade, and the rest of it's knocked down. Now, obviously, it's better to keep the facade than nothing at all. But the facade, you know, is 
uh, you know, really a second best option. Um, but it seems that, you know, that's about the best we can expect from, well, it's partly, the problem I think is partly the local council. Um, I think it's partly the, the state government, but, but more than that, it's the fact that the majority of Novocastrians don't seem to have much interest in their, their local heritage. Um, now, I don't know, you know, what, we, I guess we, we try to raise awareness about these issues. Um, we continually get situations where council has spent a lot of money on employing experts to decide height limits. That then height limit becomes the minimum for new developers. Um, but they've always, well, not always, nearly always, got a reason why they should be an exception. So that it should be, you know, instead of three storeys, their one should be four storeys or, or five. They'll probably start with five and settle at four. But they've still, they've breached that height limit. And this is happening, um, you know, fairly consistently in, in various parts of the city. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Anyway, it's good that the, they say the Wickham School of Arts. So you got that. Yes. I think Amanda's got a hand up too. Jenny. I was going to say. Okay. Sorry, okay. sorry, Amanda. That's okay. You. You've got two representatives from the National Trust today. Oh, You're very good, lucky. Good, good, You're very good. lucky. If I can just add a small little bit onto onto Ross, yeah. what Ross said, um, I'll say just generally the National Trust we've been bubbling along nicely, not too busy, but um, uh, in socials where I don't know if Amanda follows us, but we're on on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, our posts this month have been on the Blue Pro uh, Plaques program, which happened in um, New South Wales. Um, and we've done Perkins Street Stairs and the Newcastle GPO updates, um, just a couple of local matters. Um, the other couple of uh, areas we're dealing with, because a lot of our projects last for a while, is uh, the Cathedral Park, the cemetery there, the headstones are deteriorating. So. We're just trying to raise awareness again about that, um, touching base with council and the cemeteries um, committees at National Trust, see what we can do there to get some action happening, if possible. Um, and obviously National Trust was also involved with Dr. Elizabeth Farrelly came to town recently, the academic and journalist um, who wrote Killing Sydney, uh, and she did a presentation. So we accompanied her for the day uh, to talk and toured uh, Newcastle talking about some of the challenges with development and urbanisation and et cetera. And that was quite um, quite quite good thing to do. And otherwise we've got our National Trust AGM for New South Wales that's happening in Sydney. And that's on November 26th at Miller's Point. Otherwise, hey. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you very much, Ross. Okay. Could um, I just say, please, um, uh, the cathedral park was never actually finished. It was given to the council to put back all the um, stone monuments that were there in their original positions. They'd all been moved over to one side years ago. And they haven't all been put back yet because they ran out of money. Yeah, so they, they never had the funding to do them all. They only had the funding to do 10 or something. So and the oldest one there for Mary Martin of Wallace's Plains, it's still not back in its yeah. site. That was the yeah. original one. I think it's a question of funding. So, um, yeah. but yeah, the I original fund was only for 10. Um, uh, excuse me. I'm just wondering whether Amanda could tell us if there's a local person standing in the uh, National Trust that we should be all voting for. Uh, you know, is there any, anyone from the local area standing for election? For the, the, for the board, Trust for, board. For, the, for the National Trust boards in Sydney? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we have some board members. We have some board members, but I don't believe there's any in this round that are going from... Yes. From Newcastle, I don't believe. We've got some on there, though, that are, uh, like, uh, we have Catherine Pitkin. She's already on there. Um, right. But yeah. she's not up for election. That's the important thing. Not for thing. this round, I don't believe. Not, and not. That's really important to make sure yeah. that we have uh, someone down there. I agree. We generally try to get make sure there's, because you have your metropolitan candidates and your non-metropolitan, so we just try to encourage non-metropolitan where we can. So you get a, a, a balanced voice. Right. Okay. Uh, concerning... And concerning the uh, cathedral cemetery, 
uh, the, the council was required by act of parliament to prepare a full um, uh, monument that would actually include all the names of all, all the uh, people in, uh, interned in the, in the cemetery. So, and that was never completed. The, what the best we got was names on each of the stairs as you go up mm. and, and that's most unfortunate yeah. uh, way of doing it. But there is a plan, a very good plan that the council has, but it's a matter of funding. Mm. It's like yeah. everything. It's like the the rural yeah. museum. It's yeah. all a matter of funding. You well, can't get professional the, people to to work on these things if you haven't got funding for them. Yeah. You know, well, it's look, really the, the, it's got to be money. Doug, the best um, job that's been done on the park has been done by the Newcastle Family History Society. Uh, their book lists every single um, burial. Yes, uh, including three thousand infants. So it's it's quite a monumental task, but anyway, I must move on. Yes, because we've got two um, researchers. But it's not like available at the at the site. You know, when people go, relatives go there, or people that are interested, they go there. They want to see it at the site, and you know, in yeah. in well, Europe, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it, it's it's it's. I guess there are challenges with with the thousands of people that are interred there. That's the thing. But anyway, well, they do it at other places. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, you can go to other uh, cemeteries where it's done properly, or it, or in Europe at the uh, war cemeteries. Yeah, the the book is there. Yeah, waiting for you. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, okay. We've had to come to our meeting. Yes. That's right. Yes, we don't have a. I don't know if there's any representatives from the city of Newcastle to speak. But if there Tom are, they're welcome. Tom Smith was he's the heritage officer now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, maybe we can send a note. Um, Emily. Emily Connell has just finished um, quite a deal of work on the Copley slides. Uh, is Emily there in the room? Yes, I am. Thanks, Johnny. There you go. Over to you. Um, so my name's Emily. I'm the Vera Deacon intern um, in Special Collections. So I'm in Special Collections for about 12 months. Um, over the last seven months, um, I've had the opportunity to be able to um, to be able to rehouse the Copley slides, and that's been fantastic because that's added a really valuable. Sorry, Doug. Can you mute yourself? I think there's a bit of sound coming through. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Sorry. Um, so being able to rehouse the Copley slides and digitise them has provided a really nice perspective into the changing landscape of Newcastle. Um, so the Copley slides collection was donated by Sandra Saxby at the beginning of the year. Um, and Sandra is the, lead, um, the niece of the late Janet Copley. Um, and this is a contribution to the Mervyn Janet Copley archive. So um, this collection had um, 3,000 slides in it. So it was a really, really big collection um, in a bunch of beautiful um, metallic boxes, keeping them safe. And what I've done over the past seven months is I've um, taken all of those slides, created metadata and put them into rehoused albums that now live in special collections. Um, and what we've also done is we've made a list of um, all of the slides within those 3,000 that were relevant to um, Newcastle and to the Hunter and local heritage and history. And we've made those available on Hunter, um, sorry, on Living Histories as digitised items, which people can view, um, which they can use and which they can recollect on as well, which is really important. Um, so they're all nice and safely housed now. Um, they're accessible. Um, we've written an article as well um, on Hunter Living Histories, which goes into a little bit more detail as well, just about what was donated, um, what the conditions were and what they look like now. I've put in a couple of photos of um, my progress doing it um, and I've put up a couple of my favourites um, that I've called Newcastle's Golden Age because these were the 60s and you get to see um, the beautiful landscape of Watt Street. That's um, International Peace Day um, in Civic Park. So you get to see that real community that's building around those central parts of Newcastle. Um, and it's definitely worth a look. Um, it's great for research as well. Uh, and it's all available as well for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. And another one, um, and one other one of our wonderful students, Isabel Whittle. 
has done a post on Robin Gordon, the accidental nurse. Isabel, over to you. Yeah, so um, I'll keep it short and sweet. I'm aware that we're sort of running out of time. And I also am going to speak off the cuff, so it probably won't be extensive anyway. But essentially, over the last semester, I've been doing a work integrated learning placement with the Glamex lab with Anne um, as my supervisor. And my main project during this placement was an oral histories project. Um, and this particular oral history interview that I did was with Robin Gordon, who uh, was a nurse in the Royal Newcastle Hospital in the 1960s. And to accompany that, I wrote a blog post that I published on the Hunter Living Histories website. And surprisingly, it was quite successful. And I think I could owe that to Robin Gordon's connections and popularity within the local community because of, she's so community minded and she's done a lot for our community. So I think people were quite interested to read. Uh, yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> a connection in this room. But yeah, so um, yeah, that's what I've been done. I've, uh, I've also uh, digitized the photos or many of the photos that were donated by Robin Gordon. Um, that I've included in this blog post and in the interview. Um, and yeah, so I found my placement quite reward, rewarding. Apartments. Yeah, there are apartments. Yeah, yeah. Apartments. Yeah. Apartments, yes. yeah, it was quite Probably interesting to see the, the, the pictures and hear the stories of, of the Royal Newcastle Hospital because truly I didn't know all that much about it before I. The oldest hospital in Australia is still on its original site when it relocated in 2006. Wow. Well, in go. Australia, 1817. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, now, look, we have run out of time, but look, please don't forget to come down the stairs. If you want to see the rest of the updates, they're on the Hunter Living Histories um, showcase page. Most of them relate to things that have gone up online, such as the Maitland films from 1926 to 1956. Um, the Open Access Week with the Wilfield Climate Archive, the Stuarts and Lloyds Australian Films, which are donated back in 2015, um, and some other updates that we've got. So I'd like you to have a look at those at your leisure and just click the links. But there's some really wonderful stuff there, especially if you're from the Maitland District um, with the Victory Day parades from 1946. Um, there's even the Queen's visit that was in the middle of one of the films. So these are like, um, we're not quite sure who the family was that donated them or where they came from. We think it's the Pender family, um, but we can't be 100% sure. But if anyone recognises anybody in the films, including Steve the Tack, Steve the cat that's being attacked by a magpie please let me know um but they're they're charming sort of films and they're pretty rare and uh thanks to um Greg and Sylvia Ray and Pete Smith um who saved them from oblivion um for us so um please thank you very much for your attendance today if you come down and have a look at the selection of recent purchases that we've got here some of the very rare including the maps of the harbours of New South Wales, which is 1827. I mean, this is one of the Joseph Cross plans. So he did um, the famous one of Danga, and he also did the one of Port Stephens of, um, as well. And he did this one. So we've also got hand-coloured engravings. So, and while you're down here, don't forget to see the crafted exhibition um, that recently launched last week. So, yes, Ron? Just a quick one, Johnny. If, if anyone's interested, when the uh, flight path for the memorial service on Friday in Civic Park is on, the flight path is going to be by one of the uh, Wedgetail uh, radar planes. It's coming in from the sea. It'll be a couple of degrees south of Fort Scratchley, but when you take in the height of Fort Scratchley, it'll only be about 300 feet above. So all are welcome. The fort will be open if that's where they would like to have a clear view of that. They're all welcome. Thank you very much, Ron. Yep. And, uh, yeah, sorry, who was that? No, just in relation yep, yep, to the Remembrance sure. Day, um, the Friends on Ash Island are holding our inaugural Remembrance Day service, commencing at 20 to 11 on Friday at the Remnant Radar Station. We've got right. members of the RAF Association and 
the RAF base in attendance. Excellent. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And um, yes, and also just uh, for Remembrance Day this, um, this year, which is coming up very soon. Thank you very much to all the presenters today. And um, um, yes, it's been a very interesting set of uh, presentations. So anyway, thank you very much. We'll see you next month for our last meeting of the year before we celebrate the 20th anniversary next year, Doug. <laughs> uh, so the next meeting will be on the 5th of December and you're all welcome to either attend in person or uh, um, join us through Zoom. Anyway, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.